Hello, today we are going to have a look at the MCDU in the Phoenix Airbus A320 in Microsoft Flight Simulator and more importantly we're going to look at how to program a route into the MCDU and how to change that route. We're going to do it both manually and with SimBrief. Okay, so the first thing we do is we press Control and 1 which centers up the MCDU on our screen. It says select desired system so we are at the top tree of the system. If you get lost within any of the menus you can just press the MCDU menu button which will take you back to this page. The first thing we're going to do, which you would do at the start of a flight, is go to the config page. So you click the soft key next to any of the options and it shows you your options for fuel and cargo. So if you go into fuel you can key in the amount of fuel you have in the aircraft. Okay. So you will notice this is directly linked to the payload here in the simulator. So if we go and ma manipulate this you can see the numbers changing as we drag the bars around. Okay, so let's go and give it 80% full of fuel which is quite a lot or we can take it back down to what we had before so if we go and fill this back in with was it 70 or it was about 10,000 wasn't it? Uh, I'm just checking 10,400 we had previously. 10.7 there we go, it's close enough ok so you can see you can manipulate the fuel, you can either do it by keying them in or you can um, go and change the, the sliders in Microsoft Flight Simulator passengers, again you can change the numbers to suit the passenger loadout so if you're working from an operational flight plan on paper and doing it you know, by the book then you would use the numbers on the operational flight plan ok so if we come back to the MCDU menu, you actually program the flight plan in the FMGC section. So we come in here, the first thing it shows you is the dates of your database of the, the waypoints and route information that's built into the system. So we can pretty much ignore that. And if we then go to initialization data, we'll just clear out any messages we have at the bottom. That's telling us basically that the GPS system is lined up. We're, we are in a, an aircraft that is ready to fly basically. Just to show you how that is done, if we look down at the tablet at the side of the cockpit, in order to get a, an aircraft that's ready to go, all you have to do is go into the Phoenix app on the tablet. And you can go to panel states. And you can change the entire aircraft to be either cold and dark or ready to go for example. When you click on one of these it says would you like to activate it or set that as the default. So we're not going to bother because we're already here. But we will come down to the MCDU so we'll press Control 1 again. So we can ignore this page pretty much and we're going to go straight to the initialization page. So in it is where you start to program your flight plan. So we need to put where we're going from and to and in common with lots of my other videos we're going to use a known route so from Echo Golf Sierra Sierra, which is Stansted Airport, to Echo Golf Papa Hotel, which is Edinburgh. So notice the format of this. This matches the format of the field for from and to. Okay, so when I click the soft key, it will plug those in. So it knows where we're going from and to now. We can make up a flight number of our own design. Doesn't matter. Obviously, if you've got an operational flight plan, you just copy this. Cost index, again, that will be on your, your um, operational flight plan. This is the how aggressively the aircraft is allowed to accelerate or climb. So it's basically controlling the economy level of the aircraft. Higher numbers means it's, you know, it's going to be faster. Cruise flight level. So the flight levels are in feet divided by 100, basically. So if you had 25,000 feet the flight level is 250 or 250. Flight levels are always named as the single digits, so it would be flight level 250 if we were flying at 25,000 feet for example. Notice it calculated the temperature at the cruise altitude itself. We could have used a slash after the 250 and given it a temperature if we knew it to be different. Again it's saying GPS primary, that means basically that the GPS is lined up and it's saying initialize weights which we haven't done yet so how do we initialize weights you'll notice on the init page there are t an arrows at the top corner this means there's more than one page here 
So we can go right and we can see there's a zero fuel weight and a zero fuel weight center of gravity. So having written these down earlier, we saw them on the, um, the config page. Zero fuel weight is 59.2 tons and the zero fuel weight center of gravity was 26. So I've written these down just to shorten this video up. I guess I could also show you where else you can find this out. So if you go back over to the tablet over here, which I think we can get to with control and three, we can go to mass and balance and that will give us the same numbers, yeah? So you've got all the numbers across here. So there's your zero fuel weight and the center of gravity and the gross weight, which is plus fuel and passengers and the center of gravity. Okay, so we press control one to jump back again. And you can see having filled in that data, it's calculated everything else. So it's showing you your gross weight and center of gravity here as well. Okay, so after doing the initialization, we need to fill in more about the flight plan. We can't go straight to the performance section because it's asking about speeds to rotate and things like that, which we don't know until we know what runway we're on. Otherwise, you know, which direction are we going? Are we into the wind? Are we across the wind? Yeah, how long is the runway? And so on and so forth. So if we go to flight plan first, you can see there's some basics in here already to begin. It knows we're taking off from EGSS. It knows some data about top of climb and top of descent if you were doing a straight line between the airfields, but we're not going to. We're going to click on EGSS and say, how are we leaving Stansted? We're going to go on runway 22 and we're going to follow a standard instrument departure, which is basically a sequence of predetermined waypoints. So we're gonna click on BKY5R so you can see it's confirmed them up here, but it hasn't changed the flight plan yet. So we can go back and ignore what we've just done, or we can insert these into the flight plan. So if we do that, we get a whole stack of waypoints have appeared. Yeah, and we can use the arrow buttons up and down to scroll through. So the arrows push the waypoints either way. Yeah, so you can scroll along. But I'm pushing everything on the screen upwards by clicking the up arrow. You will notice there's a discontinuity has appeared before the end airfield. So the EGPH is the end of our flight plan, it's our destination. So the computer is not going to figure out everything, it's not going to work wonders, it's not going to guess about how to get to Edinburgh. Yeah, it's, you, it will always put a discontinuity between the departure and the destination. You can see that even if I tell it how we're going to get to Edinburgh, which I don't have to at time of takeoff, it still won't clear that discontinuity. So let's try that. I mean, normally you would do this in flight because we don't we may not know until we get to Edinburgh what the controllers are saying about you know which runway and which approach but we can do it now just for the purposes of showing you so we can come into Edinburgh in the flight plan page and we can say okay we're going to come in on runway 6 and we're going to use the AGP E1E approach route again okay, so a standard approach route or star is again just a sequence of predetermined waypoints and if we insert that Notice there's also some numbers alongside all these waypoints we're adding in. These are constraints. So the first number is a speed you are expected to be at, and the second one is an altitude. Okay? And if we go and have a look on a map of what these look like, and you can see if we... This is little nav map, by the way, and it's really good for illustrating this kind of thing. We can see there's an above 3000 there at D170E. Yeah, so that's at this particular waypoint. If, as we move along, we can see a circle moving just to highlight them. So if we go and look that up, D170E, there's star 4000. So this is slightly different than is on our map. So that means above when you get an asterisk. Okay, so let's go and move this down or scroll through them and have a look at the others. So we've got the discontinuity in the middle, but we now have got some. We've got the the beginning of that AGPE um, approach route. So we can see all those restrictions coming into play and speed restrictions coming into play. The reason they are important is if you are using the autopilot and you have it in managed altitude mode, the managed altitude will follow the restrictions. Okay. So some people say, oh, but maybe I've gone and chosen my altitude. So if we go, go back to pilot's eye view up here, 
just to see this. Maybe I've chosen to fly up to 10,000 feet. So the way to think about this is on departure, the restrictions will be followed until you are clear of them, and then it will go for your altitude. Yeah. And on arrival, you have to bear in mind bringing it down to the level of the entry into the restrictions using the altitude to descend and then it will become you know then it will start following the restrictions okay so let's go and have a look at how we get rid of that discontinuity between the end of the let's scroll the other way so that's the end of the standard instrument departure from Stansted and that's the beginning of the route into Edinburgh and it doesn't know what to do in between. So we're going to insert a waypoint or a VOR station along the way called Trent. And notice there are many Trents so it's showing you and asking which one do you mean. We know it's this one because it's only 100 miles away. We could check the latitude and longitude on the map if we wanted to but we, do, we just know so I'll select that one notice it's put Trent in so anything I click on top of so if I put another VOR station in this pole if I click on top of AGPED it will insert it in front of AGPED okay and it's done it there weren't any other ones called pole notice the flight plan discontinuity is still there so we can insert that so we want to get rid of the discontinuity notice it's scrolled back up which is really helpful we can then clear this discontinuity. So if we press clear and then select uh, the, the left key alongside the part of the route we want to get rid of, it will go away. Okay, and we can then just insert that change and then we can scroll back through our flight plan and we can see that discontinuity has vanished. Now, if you remember, there was one that appeared right at the end. We'll go and clear that one as well. Oh, it's not letting us. I think the reason for that is because this is um, after we have landed, basically. Okay, so we can leave that alone. It's worth noting how you can manipulate the waypoints. You can delete any part of it, and unlike on a Boeing, you can actually delete part of a standard approach route or a SID in the Airbus as well, and it doesn't really mind. Obviously, whether the aircraft can still follow the route is another matter. You know, you may have made a change that makes it impossible for it to make a turn. So it's going to go on best efforts, basically. But um, it's worth saying, how do we put custom waypoints in? And it's actually a lot easier in an Airbus than it, or there's meant more options in an Airbus than there is in a Boeing. So if we go to the data page, you can see we've got two pages here. We've got positions, IRS, GPS, we don't we're not really interested in those we're on page two we've got waypoints and we can invent waypoints so we could say x y z one that would be our, our new waypoint name that we're just inventing for today we can go in here and then we can say either where it is in the world or we can base it on another one so we could say well if it was from tnt and it was at 300 degrees and it was 10 miles yeah so we can say put that there and it will ask us which Trent so we say it was that one so we've now said that we have a new waypoint called XYZ1 that is at that vector basically from Trent and we store it okay so we've now made a waypoint we haven't used it yet so if we come back into our route and we can say let's go and find out where Trent was there it is in our route and now we can put in XYZ 1 and we can put it in after Trent before pole okay notice it's gone and put a discontinuity in because it always does and we can remove that discontinuity and we can insert that into our flight plan so how can we see what we've done if we press F to center our view up so we can see both screens here, what we're going to do is change this screen to work and show plan mode instead of arc mode. Okay? So in plan mode, we can use the up and down arrows to flick through our route. Now look, there's Trent 
and there's our vector across 10 miles at 300 degrees to XYZ1 which has now appeared so that was a new waypoint we invented okay obviously if we then use the arrows to go to the next one go to XYZ then on to pole onto the beginning of AGPED if you want to zoom out to see the wider view of where we actually are on the route the zoom key works up here as you'd imagine so we can go the other way as well go backwards through the route or down through the route there we go okay so hopefully that gives you an idea of how you can program routes on the FMC so the next thing we need to do if we press control 1 so we've told the aeroplane the route we want to follow and we can change that in the air okay The next thing we need to do is go and set up the performance data for takeoff, essentially. So if we go to Perf, you get the takeoff, and it's obviously got the runway. It knows we are now taking off runway 22 because we told it on the departure data in the flight plan. So then we can go to, we need to work out these V speeds. So the way you can work this out quickly, if you go to the tablet and we go to the home screen of the tablet by clicking the, the button, there's a departure performance calculator. And you'll notice at the top left, it's it knows obviously we're leaving from EGSS already. It's got the runway wrong, so we'll change that. And it's got some values that are missing over here. Takeoff weight and the center of gravity at the takeoff weight. Now, if you remember, we saw those earlier, both in the weight and balance section in here, or mass and balance, I think it calls it, and we also saw it in the MCDU as well. And I wrote them down because I'm thoughtful like that, so you, I wouldn't have to go and retrace steps with you. So 69.6 tons goes in here, and in the center of gravity at the takeoff weight was 23.4. Okay, if we try and calculate this, it will complain. It was saying we've got some entries that are invalid. And it's basically complaining about the wind parameters. Now we can either go and look those up from our operational flight plan, or we can just click on the sync button and it gets us the live data. We can now calculate and it will calculate the V speeds for the aircraft. So 150, 150, 152. Uh, so this is your maximum speed before you can cancel your um, takeoff. This is your rotate speed and this is your basically leave the airfield speed. I'm not going to go into too much detail about what these numbers actually mean today. Notice it's also calculated us the initial flap setting, which is setting one on the Airbus flap lever, and an initial elevator trim setting of up 1.1. It's also given us a flex to temp number. This is basically the outside air temperature, but we can change that when we program it into the FMC, and the reason you would do it is to give it a higher outside air temperature to derate the engines on purpose so they don't rev so high on takeoff so if you were trying to preserve the life of the engine you might put a higher temperature number into the flex temperature okay so if we go back down to the MCDU then we can put in those numbers now so 150 150 and 152 and then flaps was 1 slash up 1.1 so this is basically instructing the aircraft where to put the flaps and the also where we will where we will put the flaps and where it will put the elevator trim for takeoff in order that the elevators are in an equilibrium position so the aircraft doesn't try to lift its nose as we accelerate down the runway to the the rotate speed flex to temperature was 60 degrees so that's basically the outside air temperature and then we can go on to the next phase of flight and again you can usually leave all this alone so there's the climb data and it's based on our cost, cost index remember so this is, again is 250 knots meaning you know, managed and next phase is cruise so you're going again cost index distance 232 miles so it, you can leave all this alone as well and then the one that's important perhaps is the approach we can leave that at time of takeoff but we go and fill this in during the flight so you're going to be putting in the barometric pressure the QNH at the destination airfield the 
temperature at destination destination airfield and so on so that's going to give you your settings to to land the aircraft or for the the flight management system to be able to help you land the aircraft i should say but again we don't need to do that at takeoff okay so at that point once you've done the performance data and the flight plan you're done okay so then you would get in or get on with maybe programming the the master control panel so I think is it control I can never remember which number is which for this five six seven eight oh seven sorry control seven gets you the master control panel it actually makes more sense to see it from the side I and mean, we're not going to focus too much on this today the things you need to get ready ahead of your flight are the QNH or the barometric pressure to set up the altimeters Obviously, if you've got standby instruments, you need to go and get them ready as well. So you can see we've got a standby attitude indicator here, which we have to uncage. So that's done. And you would have to, if you have a standby altimeter, you'd have to ma make it match these numbers. So at the moment it's 1013. That may not be correct. So we can check that on little nav map in our case. It may be on your, you might get it from ATC if you're doing a live flight. So if we come down and look at the METAR information, we can see it's 1010. It's not 1013. It's close enough, but 1010. And you do that on both sides, for example. So again, we're kind of straying away from the FMC here, but you can see the basics. So you're going to set your altitude. You're going to leave everything on managed mode if you've got everything fully programmed. And you're going to get on with your flight. So today's focus was really just how we program the FMC for the flight. And we've done that. Okay, so I'm going to stop talking. So go and have fun with programming flights. I think the real takeaway today was that data page. And on the next page of data, you've got the waypoints where you can go and program your own waypoints. Okay, so that's the, the real takeaway for today. And again, to get back to the top, press the MCDU menu. Oh, one more thing. If we go to initialization, now we've programmed the rest of the route, we can go into wind and we can request the wind. So I press the button, give it a, a small chance to do it. There you go. So it's worked out the wind at all the flight levels, or it's gone and fetched the wind data for all the flight levels for our route. So it's really helped us and we can, we can do that and it changes all the numbers on the calculations about the, how long it's gonna take to get to our destination because it now knows what the winds aloft are. Okay, so that's quite an important one that I'd missed is the wind. 